Hello everyone. Today we'll continue to discuss our case of patient with hypoxemia and trying to figure out how to work them up. In the previous lecture, we understood how to find the underlying cause. In this lecture, we'll discuss how to keep these patients stable with their oxygen sats around 90 to 94% till their underlying cause is found and corrected. As we talked about in our hypoxia series, there are five physiological principles that would help you to aid you improve oxygenation in any patient. These are increasing your FiO2, increasing the surface area of absorption, optimizing your respiratory muscles, optimizing VQ matching, and decreasing work of breathing. So let's understand all these one by one. If you want to go back and review my lectures on hypoxia and understand the physiology how oxygen is absorbed and delivered to the tissues links are given below first thing is increasing their fio2 and in this you have to know how much your patient is really receiving so know this table very well using a nasal cannula you can possibly reach up to the maximum of around 50 to 60 percent fio2 you can use venturi mask which can give you more specific fio2s However, when your patient is hypoxemic, you want to give them 100% FiO2 and there are only two ways to achieve this, either by a non-rebreather mask with a bag or a high flow cannula. However, when the patient is dyspneic, most of the patient will be breathing through their mouth. So even a high flow can sometimes be inadequate for this patient. So go with the non-rebreather mask with a bag as it's a much better option and it is more readily available. Hypoxemia from hypoventilation responds very well to increasing FiO2. And in fact, you just need 30% FiO2 to correct their SATs back to 100%. We discussed how this works in our previous lecture. Please review hypoxia from hypoventilation for a more detailed understanding. Hypoxemia from hypoventilation is always accompanied by elevated carbon dioxide levels in the arterial blood. These patients are breathing slow and shallow. However, if your patient is breathing fast and is still hypercapnic, think about dead space physiology. The corollary to this is if your patient is requiring higher FiO2, hypoxemia is likely not from hyperventilation or maybe just it is a small part of the problem. Many times patients can have multiple issues going on at once. So for example, if you are evaluating a patient who has just given some morphine and he is requiring 100% FiO2 to maintain his SATs around 90%, this is not all from hyperventilation. There is something else going on with your patient as well. Number two is increasing the surface area of the alveoli. And here the mo two most important things you have to remember is secretions and atelectasis. Secretions can come in three forms which can cause problems, either they are excessive, they are thick, or your patient has neuromuscular weakness. If patient has excessive secretion, encourage cough and avoid cough suppressants. Perform a deep nasotracheal suctioning while avoiding nasal trauma, so understand the nasal anatomy pretty well. You can use a cappella or flutter devices to help you with the excessive secretions. Avoid using anticholinergic to dry up the secretions while the patient is in the hospital. These medications would inadvertently result in problems in your patients sooner or later. If the secretions are thick, make sure that you use mucolytics and mucokinetics like NSL cysteine or goefensin. Hypotonic saline NEBS are very useful in thick secretions and make sure that the oxygen that what patient is getting is humidified. Understand that humidification via the nasal cannula through that bubbler does not always gives you good humidification. If you really want good humidification, go with a high flow nasal cannula. If your patient has neuromuscular weakness, use cough assist device and chest physical therapy. Secretions and atelectasis management is very important and in this, prevention is certainly better than cure. Avoid letting your patient to be in the bed all day. Activity is the best way to prevent atelectasis and mobilize secretions. To prevent atelectasis, make sure that your patient is moving around and not sitting in the bed all day. Sitting up in the chair is better than sitting in the bed. You can use incentive spirometer and make sure you know how to use it. 
you can use intermittent positive pressure breathing devices and make sure that you have good secretion management. You should use humidification. Make sure that you provide adequate analgesia for post-op thoracoabdominal surgeries. If there are effusions, drain them. Try to avoid using 100% FiO2 unless absolutely needed. You can also use non-invasive ventilator to help recruit atelectatic areas and decrease pulmonary edema. Understand that it's the expiratory PAP or CPAP that helps with recruitment. So make sure that these numbers are high enough to prevent atelectasis. To optimize your respiratory muscles and diaphragm position, head of bed elevation is very important. While lying down, abdominal contents press against the diaphragm and decrease diaphragmatic excursion. Diaphragm lies around 4 cm lower in sitting position. Make sure that your patient are not wedged in the bed, which is very common to see. When the patient is wedged, the abdominal contents push against the diaphragm. So make sure that the hip is at the angle of the bed and not the thoracolumbar spine. In very obese patient, you can use slight reverse Trudlenburg position so that the pressure of the belly and its effect on the diaphragm are much lower as belly is now pulled down by gravity and does not press against the diaphragm. However, make sure that you don't overdo it so that patient slides down in the bed. Next method to improve oxygenation is improving VQ matching using positioning. For this, you have to understand the vest lung zones. Your right ventricle can generate a limited amount of pressure. Your average PA pressures are around 20 over 10. Your height of the lungs, however, is 25 centimeters or higher. So you can see that the lower part of the lungs will get more perfusion as compared to the middle and there will be hardly any perfusion in the apex of lungs at rest. From the previous lecture, you understood that the ventilation is almost similar in apex and at the base with slightly higher in the base than apex. So the best VQ matching is found in the bases of the lungs and this is where most of the oxygenation happens. If you look at this figure carefully, since your diastolic pressures are 10, the area of the lungs below 10 cm will be perfused both during systole and diastole, slightly higher in systole. In region between 10 to 20 cm, the lungs in this area will get perfused only during systole and in the lung higher than 20 cm, the apex of the lungs will not get any perfusion. Your PA pressures can certainly change with time and with your body demand. However, general principle is your zone 3 is the best area for oxygenation and zone 1 is the poorest. So around 80% of your oxygen that is being absorbed comes from the bases of the lungs and hardly any from the apex while you are at rest. So how can we use this information? Say for example, you have got a right lower lobe pneumonia. So the oxygenation is happening mostly from the left lower lung and from the left and right middle lungs. If you put this patient right side down, you still have some oxygenation coming from the right side of the lung. However, you have put the good lung in zone one. So your oxygenation will worsen. If you put pneumonia in zone one and good lungs in zone three, you'll see that you have improved oxygenation as your good lungs are in zone three now. One of the way that proning works is using West Lung Jones physiology. In ARDS, because of gravity, there is more dependent atelectasis and consolidation, while the anterior part of the lungs are more clear. If you put these patients in prone position, you are putting the good lung zones in zone 3 and bad lungs in zone 1. This will improve your oxygenation. However, proning works in multiple other ways to help improve the oxygenation. Some of them are decreasing the gravitational pressure from the heart and the abdominal contents. There is also more homogeneous chest wall compliance due to restriction of anterior chest wall movement. We'll discuss details about proning in some other lecture. You can also improve your VQ matching using CPAP. CPAP can help improve VQ matching in patients with autopeep, atelectasis, and pulmonary edema. Once you give CPAP to patients with autopeep, you decompress large bullet.
and allow the better perfusion to more functioning alveoli. You can recruit more alveoli in atelectasis, thus improving the ventilation perfusion ratio. And in heart failure, you can push out the fluid from the alveoli to pericapillary beds and improve oxygenation. Lastly, you have to decrease the work of breathing. If you remember, there were three types of work of breathing, elastic, resistive, and expiratory. Elastic work of breathing is a problem in patients with autopeep, atelectasis, and pulmonary edema. And all this respond very well to CPAP. Consolidation and fibrosis will also result in increased elastic work of breathing. However, these don't respond very well to CPAP therapy. If you got pleural effusion, draining them can help. If you have resistive work of breathing, use bronchodilator and make sure that if there are secretions, you clear them out. You can also use Heliox to increase the laminar flow. Expiratory work of breathing is mostly from autopeep and you can use CPAP to counter these. If you want to know these in more details, please watch how to reduce work of breathing in my previous lectures. One of the things I want to talk about is how ventilator help with oxygenation. And the most important thing they do is decrease the work of breathing. So let's repeat. They decrease the work of breathing and that's how they improve the oxygenation. They take the work from respiratory muscles. Now understand that in respiratory distress, respiratory muscles can consume up to 30 to 40% of the oxygen that is being absorbed. And once you take the work of breathing from these muscles, this large amount of oxygen that was going to these muscles can now go to more vital organs. Ventilator also allowed use of sedatives and paralytics to help with work of breathing. The other ways that it can help is by giving you more control over PEEP since it's a closed circuit, better control of tidal volume and respiratory rates. It can give you an idea about lung mechanics as well. One of the things to remember is increasing the respiratory rate will not help improve the oxygenation if you are using high FiO2. So increasing the backup rate on the BiPAP to improve hypoxemia will not work. This will certainly work for hypercapnia, but not hypoxemia. So now you understand the underlying principle. Let's try to put everything together. So step one we talked about in our previous lecture is trying to figure out what happened acutely and finding the underlying etiology is important as you can start disease specific therapies. And to figure out what happened, you go ahead and make sure that you start them on 100% oxygen as soon as you enter the room. Talk to nurse and patient and get some idea about history. You watch them closely and you are looking for work of breathing, respiratory rate, chest wall and abdominal movements. You auscultate them while ordering EKG, ABG and chest x-ray. And if you got bedside ultrasound, use it to figure out what's going on. To keep the SATs around 90 to 94%, you already started with your non-rebreather mask and bag, which will give the patient 100% of IO2. Elevate the head of bed and optimize the respiratory muscles. Reposition your patient. Make sure that patient is not wedged between the angles of the bed. If the patient has secretions, use suctioning to remove them. If you hear any wheezing or any obstructive issues, you can use nebulizers. To increase the surface area in cases of atelectasis, pulmonary edema, you can use CPAP and you can also use the same for decreasing work of breathing in patient with autopeep. Optimize VQ matching by positioning good lungs into zone 3 and bad lungs into zone 1 and you can achieve them by either proning or right to left positioning. Understand that these are all supportive therapies. If you do not treat the underlying condition, your patient will eventually deteriorate. Make sure that you do not hesitate to put patient on CPAP if indicated and make sure that you call the ICU team early. In summary, no underlying comorbidities, admission diagnosis related to a respiratory failure. Find the cause for acute change and maintain the O2 sets 90 to 94% while working up for the underlying cause and thereafter. Understand that there are only few things that you can do physiologically to improve their oxygen sets and if these things don't work out, you would need more advanced airway, for example, invasive mechanical ventilation. Treat the underlying cause. 
make sure that you ask for non-invasive ventilation early if indicated and make sure that you ask for ICU help if you think that patient needs invasive mechanical ventilation. You have to understand that you have to both treat the underlying cause and support oxygenation through the treatment. One without the other will lead to poor outcomes. Thank you.